This is Blake Graham, Triple Diamond with Longevity, here with Dr. Joel Wallach, the Dr. Wallach. And we're here to talk today about the principle of absorption. We know that with nutrition, it's not what you consume that counts, it's what you absorb, right? That's right. It used to be said, you are what you eat, but that's not really true. It's what you absorb. You are what you absorb. And I know that's one of the things that makes your supplements really stand out is because they're so easy for the body to absorb. But let's talk first about how absorption works in the body. Tell us about kind of the gastrointestinal system, how it is that our body's supposed to break down food. Okay, well, digestion actually starts in the mouth. Most people don't realize it, but digestion starts in the mouth two ways. One, mechanical grinding and breaking up and chewing is very important, getting pieces smaller and smaller and smaller. In fact, the human body is a juice machine. Everything is moving towards being juiced, right? So we're going to chew things up, chop things up into small swallowable pieces. And saliva actually has tylen in it, which is a carbohydrate busting enzyme. It actually begins to break down carbohydrate into sugars and sugars into simple sugars and so on. And so digestion begins in the mouth. It goes down to the esophagus to the stomach and the pH change from an alkaline environment, which is in the mouth, to a very acid environment. Your stomach has to be a pH of one and a pH range of one being the most acid, seven being neutral and 14 being the most alkaline. It's imperative that your stomach environment be acid for several reasons. Number one, it sterilizes the stomach so yeast and bacteria don't grow there and prevents the formation and fermentation of carbohydrates and sugars and fiber into gases and which causes bloating and reflux and heartburn and all that nasty stuff. Also, the enzyme pepsin, which is produced by the stomach, requires a acid environment to function properly. Pepsin is the protein digesting enzyme. It breaks down uh, animal flesh proteins, plant proteins, including grains, uh, eggs, and so forth, uh, cheeses, milk. Any proteins are broken down into the simplest of amino acids uh, by pepsin in the stomach. The acid environment is also required for a substance called Castle's intrinsic factor, which is produced by the stomach wall, to bind with vitamin B12 and absorb vitamin B12. You cannot absorb vitamin B12 without the being um, first very seriously acidified. The uh, intrinsic factor just won't work. There are cells in the lining of the stomach that actually make the stomach acid. Hydrochloric acid, is, they're called chief cells. And these chief cells require sodium chloride as a raw material to make hydrochloric acid. So that's kind of what goes on in the stomach. Uh, when the stomach churns things around, continues this mechanical breaking down, the acid begins to break down um, food by actually dissolving the connective tissue and separating fibers and cells of your food. And then, of course, there's a pepsin digestive enzymes, which break down the proteins into polypeptides, long strings of amino acids down to tripeptides, which are three amino acids, dipeptides, which are two amino acids. So the goal is to get down to the simplest amino acids, which makes protein digestion and absorption easier. Then as the food moves into the duodenum, some people say duodenum, but du duodenum is how I learned it. The pancreas and the liver both empty into the common bile duct, uh, which then empties into the duodenum. And the pancreas actually produces quartz of alkalizing mucus and um, bicarbonate in the form of bicarbonate. And the purpose is to alkalize the duodenal environment because the pancreatic enzymes and the intestinal enzymes only work in an alkaline environment. So you got to switch from being very, very acid to very alkaline. So all enzymes are very pH dependent. Oh, they, absolutely. They work in a certain pH range. And if you get out of that pH range, those enzymes aren't as effective. Well, they become a non-factor, they're just zero. Uh, they will not work if they're not in the right pH range. And this is why we die from changes in pH of our cells. Uh, the enzymes in our cells don't work either, and not only the digestive system outside their pH range. And if you get into acidosis, and normally our body itself is supposed to be like 7.1 and uh, pH just a little above neutral, and you get to be 7.3, you're in what's called alkalosis, you're in the hospital dying because there are all your enzymes in your cells stop. It's too, too high of a pH. If you get down to, say, 6.9 or 6.8 below neutral, you're on the acid side, you're in acidosis, you're in the hospital dying because the enzymes can't work in an acid environment either. So we've got very strong acid environment in the stomach, but in it, once we get into the small intestine, the body actually shifts the pH levels changes the environment because we have different enzymes going to work? Yes, you have a whole plethora, I guess is the word that Cher uses. Okay. <laughs> a whole plethora of enzymes that are produced by the pancreas to digest 
proteins again to digest carbohydrates uh, down from long chains, hundreds of sugars down to polysaccharides or disaccharides, which are multiples of sugars, two sugars down to simple sugars and break down uh, complex sugars into simple sugars. It also has uh, lipases, all the enzymes that are produced by the pancreas end in the suffix ACE, A-S-E. And so if there's a pept peptase, you know, you're, that, that's a pancreatic enzyme. Like lactase we hear about for breaking down lactose. Exactly. So all the ACE means they're pancreatic enzymes that are digesting long chains of things down into their simplest components for absorption down the pike. And once we break them down, then we still have to absorb them. That's correct. How does that work in the intestines? Well, we got one more piece going on here. Okay. And that is the bile coming down the bile duct, which is produced by the liver, the largest gland in the body, is designed to do two things. Uh, number one, homogenize fats, take them from big, large molecules of fat down to little droplets uh, in a very uniform fashion, purpose of which is to absorb fats. So when the fats are attached to bile salts, you absorb these fats uh, easier. You go from large fats down to fatty acids. Okay, our, our triglycerides, which is a three-carbon glycerol with three long chains of fat on it. Triglycerides, that's where that comes from. And so the bile breaks all that down into the simplest of uh, fats called fatty acids. Then the bile also helps you absorb fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. Also, the bile uh, from the liver helps you absorb cholesterol, the good fats, very important to everything from your cell walls to your brain to nerve insulation and storage of energy and so on. Then as this whole is kind of a soup at this point, it's called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, and this soup moves down the intestine to where if the stomach and the duodenum or duodenum and the pancreas and the liver and the bile have done their job, now you just have this soup moving down the intestines. And instead of just being a smooth tube, the, in the intestinal absorptive surface is magnified like 85 times by these finger-like villi, which stick up and, and it looks like velvet when you open up an intestine with a knife and you look at with a naked eye at the intestine. But when you look at it under the microscope, this velvet is actually uh, produced by finger-like villi, uh, which have little blood vessels up in them which then get the blood closer to the surface of the cells in the intestines. So when you absorb this, um, the molecules now of fat and proteins or amino acids and fatty acids and simple sugars, it goes through one cell in the intestine right into these little blood vessels, little capillaries, if you will, then into the bloodstream, which then goes up the hepatic vein in through the liver for the most part. And then the liver pulls out what it wants and then distributes everything else. When we talk about these villi, I've seen slides, and it looks like, almost like imagining a visual of carpet fibers, right? And That's on correct. each of these carpet fibers, then there are individual hairs that stick Micro out. Micro That actually, again, you said increase the surface area of the that's stomach correct. by 85-fold. Yes, that's correct. And also they have a, a certain amount of muscle in them so that there's this peristaltic waves of the muscle in the intestine squeezing things along, just like you would you know, take one of these uh, uh, large, long balloons and you'd take your fingers and you would just kind of move, um, say, the narrow part of it down. You can, you know, how these magicians do that with the, uh, these long balloons, make little animals and things by moving the narrow piece up and down the balloon. Uh, with their hands. Well, the muscles in the, stom uh, the stomach do that, the muscles in the intestinal walls do that, and the muscles in these little villi do that. Additionally, there's a wave-like motion. In addition to this large muscular motion, there's also this wave-like motion of these villi that move things along. And also it opens up the space between the villi so more stuff, more of this chyme can get down in between them and be exposed to the surface area. Now, is that why when people have inflammation, it, it really decreases the absorption area? They get inflamed and food can't get down between there? And that the is correct. The That's microbiome. one of the things that happens when you have inflammation for any reason, whether you have an infection like salmonella, you know, sal you get a salmonella infection or you get food poisoning and everything comes out the other end because you can't absorb it, the, these little villi swell, as you can imagine. Right. They swell and it closes off that space in between them, as you point out. And even the tips of them get all inflamed and, and swollen, and so they cannot perform their function, or absorption is reduced to almost zero at that point. 
Now, what's the role of the good bacteria in our intestinal tract? What does that do for our bodies? Well, the good bacteria, 99.9% .9 of them are in the colon. They're not in the stomach, which is sterile if you have the right amount of acid. They're not found in the small intestine if you have the right amount of alkali. And so the good bacteria kind of survive. I mean, let's say you, you, you swallow a million probiotics, maybe only 20,000 get through your stomach because the acid kills them all. Right. Okay. Then out of the 20,000 gets into your small intestines, maybe another 10,000 die uh, because of the alkaline environment. So there may be only 10,000 make it to your colon. But when they get there, that's the perfect environment for them, pH-wise, uh, oxygen-wise, and so forth. And they begin to flourish and reproduce themselves, and 10,000 will become billions. And what do they do? Well, they actually fend off bad bacteria by just being there and growing their presence. Uh, they're called commensals. Uh, they're just there. Most of them don't produce anything good for us, but their presence crowds out the bad guys. There's also a symbiotic relationship with some of these probiotics in that they produce vitamin C, they produce uh, vitamin B12, they do all kinds of nifty stuff by producing certain vitamins. And this, is, this actually happens in animals in their digestive tracts as well. I always smile when vegetarians say, well, look, there's a cow and an elephant, and they eat grass, and look at them. Why can't we just eat vegetables? Well, when you look at a cow or a deer or an antelope, the, uh, these are four-stomach animals, moose and yaks and very large um, four-stomach animals. And there's probably a reason why they have four stomachs. Well, if you think about it, if you look around the world, what is the most, other than rodents, uh, what is the most common vertebrate you see other than human beings around the Earth? four stomach animals. Every continent has four stomach animals. Whereas uh, elephants are in a very micro environment, right? Lions and tigers are in micro environments, monkeys are in micro environments. But these four stomach animals, ruminants as they're called, are found in every environment of the world. There's actually musk ox up above the Arctic Circle and you have all these hundreds of different antelopes in Africa and you got uh, many species of deer and moose and wild sheep and goats in North America. Cattle. Cattle. There's wild cattle all over the place, uh, especially in Asia, and they've been domesticated, and wild goats and wild sheep. And so uh, these things uh, are very universal because they're able to digest things that nothing else can digest. They can take grass, which is essentially useless to all animals, but what they do is there's a big, there's four stomachs, and the first two are kind of mechanically breaking things down, but the third stomach is called the rumen, and in a cow, it's, it contains 40 gallons of fluid, and it's a big fermentative vat. It's kind of like making beer in there, right? And remember, I said that our whole digestive system is a juice machine, making things into juice. Well, a cow has this big 40-gallon rumen, R-U-M-E-N, um, fermentative vat. is full of bacteria and yeast and fungus and viruses and protozoa. Now, what's the difference between a protozoa and a bacteria? Well, a bacteria are plants. Protozoan are animals, and they have little villi, like little oars in a boat, and, and they move around with these little villi, and they consciously move from here to there, and they have pumps that move things around. They're, they're little animals. And so it's this big vet that's breaking down the grass so that the cow can access the nutrients in it. That's correct, and that's a simplistic way of putting it. It's more complex than that, in that the enzymes produced by the bacteria and the fungus and the yeast break down the grass, which is cellulose primarily, like heavy fiber, and it breaks it down into carbohydrates and um, complex sugars and then simple sugars. Well, then other bacteria take those simple sugars and ferment them and add nitrogen to them and turn them into amino acids. Mm. What happens now, here's these paramecium, these protozoa, which are animals, not bacteria, not okay. plants. And so now these protozoa, these little animals, can actually take these amino acids and turn them into protein for themselves. Okay. Then they also can take inorganic minerals and convert them, the, the bacteria turn them into chelated minerals, which are inorganic minerals that are, that are combined with amino acids, right? Now these little protozoa can use them, minerals for themselves, and then the cow eats the little animal. All right. It goes into the fourth stomach. So in the end, the cow is a carnivore. The cow is eating little animals in the fourth stomach called an abomasum. So the cow is eating grass to feed the little animals. Yes, the you, now you got it. All right. And that's why the theory of vegetarians is incorrect. Okay. Because we cannot survive eating vegetables. Okay, so cows and... All ruminants. Ruminants. Whether they're a giraffe or a wild cow or sheep or goat or deer or a moose or a yak or 
um, musk ox or any of these four stomached animals, the common thing is you hit it exactly right. They're, they're eating this grass to feed the little animals, which they then eat. Wow. And we know from your Dead Doctors Don't Lie audio cassette that having those chelated minerals are so important because inorganic minerals we just don't absorb. Exactly. Inorganic minerals, even for animals, you know, they eat clay and all that kind of stuff, again, to feed these little animals within inside of them. And inorganic minerals are only usable 3 to 5%, 3 to 10%. And the four stomach animals do a little better job than the single stomach animals like monkeys and horses and things like that. And you and I, of course. And um, this is why in crossing the prairie, it was much more efficient to use oxen, big, large teams of oxen pulling the wagons. Because, than horses. Than horses. Because they, if they use horses, they had to carry extra wagons hauling grain to feed the horses. They couldn't survive just eating the prairie grass where the oxen could because of the four stomachs. Well, that's like the... Eco cars, we talk about, you know, they can get further uh, on less fuel, essentially, because you, you don't have to carry fuel around with them, with the oxen. Then. Exactly. So, in the human digestive tract, then, since we don't have the four stomachs, we obviously have to have food that's uh, from various sources, because we can't break down the grass. But when we get to the colon with the good bacteria there, is there anything else that we need to know about what that good bacteria does. And I'd like you to mention a little bit about the appendix, because most of us have been taught that the appendix is just, you know, something in there that we don't know what it's good for. You know, maybe the good Lord put it in there so surgeons would have something to take out, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> well, that's what they think, I'm yeah, sure. But I know that there's a reason for sure. it. Well, there's multiple reasons, but um, one of the main ones is, you've all heard of T-cells, right? Right. T-cells. T-cells are activated by the thymus gland. That's why they're called T cells, T for thymus. Yeah, you know, often killer T cells are part of the immune system. You got it. And they can't function until they're activated. The switch is turned on when they flow through the thymus. Okay. That's why they're called T cells. And if you surgically remove your thymus or you kill it with radiation, you'll never have active T cells. You'll have lots of T cells, but they won't be activated and can't do anything of any consequence for, for your immune system. Well, there's another set of white blood cells that attack foreign invading bacteria and viruses and fungus and things, cancer cells. They're called B cells, and they're activated by the appendix. Well, wait a minute. If you have T cells that are activated by the thymus, you can understand T for thymus, T for T cells. Why would you have the appendix activating B cells? Well, that's because they first realized this in the bursa of Fabraceous in chickens, which is the appendix in chickens, mm. called the bursa of Fabraceous. A fellow by the name of Fabraceous figured it out that these cells, these defensive white blood cells are activated by the bursa of Fabraceous in the chickens and so he called them B cell for bursa. Okay, so if somebody doesn't have their appendix because they have you their You cannot appendix, activate right? the B cells so and you immune. lose a significant portion of your immune system. When we need to make sure that the nutrients get absorbed in the body then, we need to look at our body's ability to digest it and since it starts in the mouth and in the stomach and we need an acid environment, what are some of the things that our bodies need to produce acid? Now you mentioned like we need NaCl, table salt, right? Yes, NaCl, sodium chloride. Right? Mm -hmm. And chemically, HCl, hydrochloric acid, has the same chloride ion that salt does, right? That's correct. So do we need to have salt in our diet in order to make hydrochloric it's, acid? It, Blake, it's an essential nutrient. You cannot live without sodium chloride. Anybody who says you need to restrict salt should be put in jail for reckless endangerment. This is what acidifies your stomach. And people who do not consume salt will set themselves up for many, many, many diseases and increase their risk of allergies because you can't break down proteins into the simplest of amino acids. And these dipeptides, two amino acids, tripeptides, polypeptides, multiples amino acids become allergens. You're, you can absorb them in your bloodstream, but your body recognizes them as oranges or beef or eggs. And so what happens is you get allergic to those foods when you cannot fully digest them down to the simplest of amino acids. They're treated like foreign invaders. Exactly. So it's a real hazard. And so it's imperative that you have stomach acid. There's actually specialized cells in the stomach called chief cells. You actually recognize them on microscopic sessions of the stomach. They're, they're very distinctive and very separate from the, just the standard uh, cells in the stomach. Uh, like I say, imperative, nothing happens. And also acidifies the minerals. For instance, you can be supplementing with all the iron you want. I mean, with tons of iron, and you can still be iron deficient if you don't have enough stomach acid to then acidify that iron so that it uh, is usable, absorbable in the body. Just like we said before, it's not what you eat, it's what you absorb that counts. Exactly. 
Right now, we have more and more problem with uh, a lot of people with digestive issues. And that's the title of this recording here, Serial Killers, we call it. Serial, not like uh, serial with an S, like a repeat, but mm -hmm. serial with the C, like the grains. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because we're seeing an increase in the amount of a lot of these grains and cereals in our diet. I think the World Health Organization actually did a study and they looked at the number of increase in the carbohydrates and our carbohydrates have more than doubled over the last few decades and 85 percent of that is an increase in those breakfast cereals right and so when we're getting more and more cereals and more and more grains in the body especially we talk about wheat barley rye and oats and I know there are some people that talk about uh, hybridization you know I know in farming technique you're an expert in agriculture as well there was a time when the farmers and agriculture actually looked at hybridizing wheat so we get a more robust wheat that will grow in a lot of different environments, the shorter grain stock to increase yield. But it's not just having a more robust wheat, it's actually the body's ability to break it down and the decrease of the salt in the diet because more and more people are saying, hey, low salt, low salt, low salt because we've heard about it from doctors. What does that do when we have more grains and we've decreased the body's ability to break it down? Well, that's about 16 questions. <laughs> and so basically, you have to appreciate that the hybridization of all things in agriculture is designed to increase yields. Uh, more, as you say, you, the word more robust and able to fend off enemies like bugs and uh, smut, which is like fungus and things of that nature. Growing environments where it couldn't grow before. Maybe, but also... Uh, what happens is you give up something when you hybridize okay. a, a plant. Anytime you inbreed it or hybridize it, you're giving up something to get something. In the case of uh, better defenses, to fend off, again, uh, yeast and bacteria and fungus and viruses that attack the plants so you don't have to use pesticides, you're able to grow them in a more organic sort of way you're avoiding more chemicals by so there's not it's it's not intended to be a bad thing to hybridize them because if you build a plant that can fend off bugs and bacteria and viruses without the use of chemicals that's very good right unfortunately there's always unintended consequences one of the unintended consequences of hybridizing wheat for instance is the reduction in protein uh, back at the turn of the 20th century depending on the strain of wheat uh, the species of wheat you had uh, anywhere from 13 to 17 percent protein. Well, today it's about 3 percent protein. So okay. the amount of protein goes way down uh, by hybridizing uh, grains uh, to fend off parasites and bugs and so forth. And as a result, it's almost all carbohydrates now and very little in the way of protein. And so this is why in the livestock industry we had to come along with soybeans to add to animal feed to raise the protein levels because grains greater yields in terms of tons and bushels per acre doesn't have enough protein for them and so we had to add the soybeans to bring the protein level up to satisfy the need for raising livestock either for reproduction or fattening in the feedlot for for steaks and shops and so on. So the increase in carbohydrates could that be an increase in like cellulose? It is a partially an increase in cellulose and cellulose is what makes a carrot pop when you, you know, when you break right. it and you bend it. Uh, cellulose is what makes a stalk of celery stand up straight. Okay, mm -hmm. And uh, isn't cellulose pretty hard to break down? Well it is and this is where all these little bacteria and yeast and things in the cow's room in that, for, uh, that that's actually the third stomach um, uh, does that. They have little enzyme systems that break down that cellulose called cellulase. Okay, Human beings don't have cellulase. And so we don't do a very good job. We don't have that big third stomach with 40 gallons of all these bacteria and yeast fermenting the stuff with cellulase breaking down that cellulose, right? So what happens when it's not broken down? What does that do to the villi? Well, uh, that alone won't do much to the villi, but it can give you a soft stool. Or I mean, a lot of people use fiber if, as another term for cellulose or fiber. And they use that to have a bowel movement. It, it makes the, the transition time, the movement time from the mouth to coming out in the bowel movement in the toilet shorter. Okay, and this okay. is what helps people that are constipated, is that uh, cellulose. Uh, that's what fiber is, is cellulose. Okay? Right. And so it can be medicinally useful as long as it's a neutral type of cellulose. If it comes from foods that cause um, intolerances, not allergies necessarily, but intolerances that can create more problems and other unintended consequences. Well, yeah. 
explain to us what you mean by intolerance, because this is, I think, a new term for most people. What most people think of food allergies, mm -hmm. but we're talking about something that's not a blood allergy, an allergic reaction that happens when undigested particles get in the blood. It's something different. You often call it like a contact allergy. Yeah, sure, exactly. You've hit the nail on the head there, Blake. Um, the, the typical allergies, whether you're inhaling them, you know, like dust and pollens and things, they get into your bloodstream through uh, your lungs. And these large protein pollens and pollens are essentially the sperm of plants, is what they are. Pollen is the sperm of plants. Okay. And it travels through the air to fertilize the eggs. The flower is sitting there waiting. That's why bees go from flower to flower, taking the sperm from one flower into the ovary of the other flower. That's, that's how that works. And um, the pollen is a very high protein thing. And we actually have some great pollen products of pollen burst, right? It's, right, right. It has flower pollen, not bee pollen, and as a result, it's less allergenic than bee pollen because bee pollen has bee spit and bee pee that uh, becomes a sensitizing factor in its own right. As these large, relatively large biochemical protein or polypeptide products get in your blood, it sets up an immune reaction and your body recognizes these proteins as being eggs and cabbage and beef and fish and shrimp and so you become allergic to them. You set up allergies to them because your body's trying to protect you from this foreign invader, perceives as a foreign invader. And that's because... Well, it's a protein and you're not supposed to be able to absorb whole proteins. Okay. Okay. We're supposed to absorb only simple amino acids, uh, otherwise they set up these allergies. Well, intolerances are different. As you point out, there are contact things. There's a lot of people who can't wear certain me uh, metals and rings and jewelry and bracelets or watches or eyeglasses. Or nickel will set up almost like an eczema where that metal touches. That's a contact allergy. Another one I like to use as an example is poison ivy. If I have a, a theater with a thousand people in there and I test them for a poison ivy allergy, I guarantee you nobody in there will be allergic to poison ivy because they're not eating it every day and so on. On the other hand, I guarantee you they're all intolerant to poison ivy because poison ivy actually produces and releases a toxin to defend itself against foreign invaders. That's, it fends off bugs. You never see bugs eating poison ivy. Right. Okay, You never see animals eating poison ivy because after one time they won't do it again. Right, right. And that's its defense. That defense, that intolerance to that toxin or that poison or that contact poison that's produced by the poison ivy it makes your skin have almost an eczema, dermatitis, or psoriasis-like reaction. Now, the same thing happens when you consume foods you're intolerant to, not allergic to, but intolerant to, because this food will produce a contact intolerance, contact allergy, if you will. You don't have to absorb it to react to it. Right, so it's a contact allergy, not necessarily just on the skin, but contact yeah. with the intestinal lining. Yeah, and I don't like to use the word allergy because it's not a true allergy, and... People, well, we tested you for a wheat allergy and you're not allergic to wheat, but you're still going to be intolerant, intolerant. You're okay. to that gluten, okay? And so you have to really use the correct words here, otherwise people say, oh, my doctor tested me for wheat allergies and I'm negative. We can still be negative to wheat allergies and be intolerant to wheat proteins. Okay. Well, yeah, it's before, two totally different things. Before we go into what's happening there with that, um, just to reiterate, we're seeing more and more wheat and people think eating healthy means eating whole grains. And so we have a lot more wheat in our diet and at the same time, with uh, the decrease of salt, with it maybe we talk about the minerals in the soil, and fewer minerals in the soil tends to be fewer enzymes in the plants when we eat them, and so they're harder to break down. Do we see that happen? Uh, we don't well? require enzymes in plants to break down. That's a myth. Okay. We don't need enzymes in our food. Okay, because we produce our own enzymes. Yes. Yeah. If right? you're getting all your nutrients and everything's perfect, you're producing all the enzymes you can eat. Everything you eat without enzymes in it, and you'll be fine. Right. Okay. But your body has to, in order have to have raw materials, right? And in order up. to have the enzyme that breaks down wheat work, you need a pH of about you said one point five, one to one point five pH in the stomach. That's correct. So yeah. super acidic environment. What happens if you don't have that strong of stomach acid? If you haven't been eating well, salt? then the pepsin won't work. It won't digest wheat, barley, rye, and oat proteins, or egg proteins, or uh, fish proteins, or clam proteins, or any kind of proteins down into the simplest of amino acids. So we get undigested wheat, barley, rye, and oat protein that's into the intestines. You got it. Now it becomes a dangerous chemical. Okay. 
It's like little slivers that go down there and become a kind of, and then they create. It's not a mechanical a, thing. Okay, more than just a mechanical. Yeah, thing. and slivers implies to me mechanical stuff like splinters and right, right. and microscopic splinters, and so it's, it's not slivers. So I wouldn't use the word slivers. It's actually a protein. It's a microscopic droplet of protein. Okay. Okay. So it hasn't been digested. It touches these villi, and what happens? It's like poison ivy. Okay, this is like a toxin, a poison touching that villi, and it swells up. And because it, it swells up, we've cut down the we've cut down the ability of the food to get You reduce the surface area, right, which messes up our absorption. Plus, when that when that villi swells, it not only swells on the outside to close off that space in between the adjoining villi, but it also squeezes the blood vessel on the inside because the swelling also goes the other direction. Okay, on the inside, okay. it shuts off that blood vessel. So even if you can partially absorb some of that food, it, it doesn't get into the bloodstream because there's no blood in there anymore. Okay. There's no circulation. And this is why um, you have problems in another way when you have what's called celiac disease. Uh, the villi actually die. And they will because die. Because of cut off circulation. Exactly. Okay. And they die. And so now you're losing 10%, 25%, 50%, 75%, 80%, 100% of your absorptive surface. And now your intestines are just a tube. And there's actually scar tissue right behind all those dead villi. Uh, trying to protect you from the invasion of the bacteria and acids and alkali and all this other stuff. Now, when you've done all of these autopsies yes. on both people and animals, mm -hmm. did you see this? Oh, yes. Uh, it's very dramatic and very easily diagnosed uh, at autopsy or biopsy. And so you can actually feel it when you do surgery. You can run your hands down the small intestines and you can actually feel areas. And this doesn't happen all at once. It's not like turning on a switch, turning off a switch, like all your intestines go at the same time. A small baby, when they're born, if the baby is um, sensitized to gluten, the mother's eating uh, wheat and she can't digest them properly and she has asthma and she's got uh, things like eczema and other symptoms of celiac disease or irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease, all sort of colitis or Crohn's disease, these undigested wheat proteins, um, barley, rye, and oat proteins called glutens, it's a gluten category, will come through the stomach down in the intestine, it will actually touch those um, villi. They will begin to become, and they, they actually act as a, um, a poison. So those villi shrink, swell up, and there's scar tissue that's formed there. And when this happens, you get, it's almost, again, like eczema on the outside, and then your intestines will crack and seep fluid and serum and stuff, and it's a mess in there. Is that the leaky gut syndrome? Yes. That we hear about? It, can, it can be called leaky gut syndrome. There's another name for it. Okay. And doctors will call it leaky gut syndrome, but they won't really make the connection that it's caused by this mm -hmm. gluten intolerance. Okay. So we've got inflammation that decreases absorption area mm -hmm. and shuts off, shuts the, blood off the, the blood supply to the villi. Mm -hmm. We've messed up the absorption. And you mentioned that these are often characterized by a lot of essential fatty acid deficiencies. We know essential fatty acids aren't micronutrients, they're macronutrients. Yes. So your body needs a lot of them. Well, again, this doesn't happen all at once. And these, these young babies might only have 1% or 2% affected by this damage. Okay. And they have, get what's called colic. They get colic, and they're just uncomfortable. They're screaming, and they don't want you to touch their belly. They're just really sensitive. And so the mother says, well, my baby can't tolerate my milk, and they put them on a formula, and the baby's fine for a while. Okay. But the baby's been sensitized to this gluten. The baby now has a gluten intolerance. So it was undigested wheat, well, Proteins undigested gluten. Sure undigested wheat, barley, rye, or oat proteins coming through the breast milk that sensitize the baby. Okay, so now the baby's sensitized to it. Yes. It goes on formula, it does fine. It does fine. But then it gets, it grows up, starts and to eat cereal, breakfast cereal. It starts to eat solid food, is weaned off the formula on the solid foods, and now it's, it goes through the same process again because it's been sensitized, and your intestine has a memory, and it's like, oh, oh, there's that gluten stuff, and it, it reacts, and the villi shrink, and the blood supply shut off, and it goes through the whole thing again. But it's not an all or nothing thing. It'll be patches, particularly worse where the intestines curve around because everything slows down to get through there, right. so the contact is longer. And so you have patches of intestines that have inflammatory bowel disease and patches that are celiac disease and patches that are Crohn's disease, different degrees of severity all in the same intestine. But you might only have 5% afflicted in a baby. You don't really see much other than them being colicky, it would be the word, and their tummy's tender and all that kind of stuff. And then the baby, say, gets to five years of age, and the baby's got rashes and they develop asthma and they cannot 
absorb things at this point when you have say 20%, 25% of your intestines afflicted, particularly cholesterol and particularly um, omega-3 essential fatty acids because these are large complex molecules and they can't get through this damaged intestine. Do you mind just mentioning briefly here, I know we do it on other recordings, about cholesterol because a lot of people don't understand that cholesterol is an essential nutrient. Can yes, cholesterol, us? sure, Blake, cholesterol is an essential nutrient. It makes up a significant portion of the cell wall of each cell. It makes up 95% uh, of the steroid hormones in your body from your adrenal gland, from testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. It's also necessary um, as a raw material for myelin, the fatty insulation material in the brain and some of the peripheral nerves. And this myelin in the brain makes up 75% of your brain weight and it's almost 100% cholesterol. And so somebody who would say to me, oh, my doctor's jealous because uh, my um, cholesterol without medication is 90. They have advanced very severe celiac disease or irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, and or Crohn's disease. So the only time we see cholesterol that's really low is either if they're taking cholesterol-lowering drugs or they have an absorption problem. That is exactly right, which is a very, very bad thing. You do not want your blood cholesterol down below 220. You get down below 220, you're in the danger zone. More people die from heart attacks when your blood cholesterol is down below 220 than you do when it's up to 220 to 270. In fact, the people on Earth who have fewest cardiovascular events are the Inuits, the Eskimos above the Arctic Circle, and their cholesterols run 350 to 500, wow. and they have the fewest cardiovascular events until they come down here and eat like us, then they have the same ratio as we do. As yeah. long as they're eating 90% of their diet is red meat and fat, um, whale meat, whale blubber, walrus meat, walrus blubber, seal meat, seal blubber, bear meat, bear fat, they only eat 2% fish, they're doing great. Yeah. But they come down, they get a lot of grains, they develop absorption problems. And they're stir-frying and fire-frying. Right. The and they get you, Exactly. Yeah. They fry stuff and, and they uh, uh, clog their arteries because of the inflammation caused by the f bad fats uh, contacting the artery walls and they get arteriosclerosis. Now, for the people listening to this recording, I know one of the things that we often talk about as a sign to how you can tell if you have a cholesterol or an essential fatty acid deficiency is if you ever go in a room to get something, and you get to that room and you can't remember what it is you go to get you went to get that could be a sign that could be a sign you can also get cracks in your heels you can have dry skin you can have eczema you can have cracked cuticles you can have hangnails all, all you know splits in your skin and you see this actually all these things from gluten intolerance are worse during the winter time okay. always worse during the winter time because our bodies obviously need more essential fatty acids to keep the moisture in during the winter time when it's cold and it's dry that well, that, 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 might, that might be a factor, but the main factor is during the wintertime, you eat more pasta, more toast, more oatmeal, more pancakes, more waffles. During the summertime, you're eating more fruits and vegetables because they're available. Okay. And so we change our dietary pattern during the wintertime. And so if you have a gluten intolerance, you're taking more gluten during the wintertime and the disease becomes more severe during the wintertime. So it's an increase of irritants. It's an increase of irritants. You got it. So if we're talking about an increase of irritants, then maybe the reverse would be true. If we get rid of all the things that are irritating the, the intestines, then do the intestines have the ability to heal themselves? They actually do. Just like your skin, when you cut your skin or burn your skin, it's able to heal itself. It rebuilds itself very quickly. It has a capacity to do that. Your intestine has the same capacity. So, if you go on a macrobiotic diet, aka gluten-free diet, and the macrobiotic diet was actually created during the 1700s uh, in Germany. The Greeks 2,000 years ago actually knew about celiac disease. And they figured out that when you give up wheat, barley, rye, and oats back 2,000 years ago and eat more rice and corn and beans, lentils, millet, and so on, and things like that, that the disease went away. And all these problems went away. And then you started eating wheat, barley, rye, and oats again, and you had this problem. Well, in Germany, they created this macrobiotic diet, which is also known as the brown rice diet. There's no magic in the brown rice, but it's the fact that you give up wheat, barley, rye, and oats. So they, somebody wanted to go gluten-free, one of the suggestions you could make is look at that microbiotic diet and not focus so much on what you can eat, but look at all the great things you can. Exactly. Well, you look at the uh, Chinese. There's 2 billion Chinese, almost 2 billion Chinese, and very few of them in China ever get celiac disease, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, and, and Crohn's disease because they eat rice and millet and they eat uh, flax and buckwheat, which is not wheat. 
and they eat sweet potatoes and squash and those sources of carbohydrates. And the same thing in America. The people who are meat eaters, the infamous meat eaters uh, who eat meat and potatoes, they have other problems, but they'll never get celiac disease because you only get celiac disease when you cannot digest wheat proteins. Right. Now, there are some things that I think make the celiac disease worse. You talked about the bad fats, the trans fatty acids, all of those partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. And I'm even seeing fully hydrogenated vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. Which is margarine. Right. So when those get in there, how do they affect the villi then? Well, they turn into what's called trans fatty acids or free radicals. And these are very egregious chemicals. They actually cause inflammation they, in, in, in of their own right. They're very inflammatory things. And everybody, everybody is sensitive to trans fatty acids. Heterocyclic amines are burnt animal fats. Okay. And then you can also have acrylamides, which are superheated carbohydrates like toast okay. and these crispy cereals, crackers, that sort of stuff. And so if you're frying potatoes, you're getting trans fatty acids from the heated oils. Even if they say, well, we fry our... Our French fries, without uh, our oils, do not have trans fatty acids. Well, as soon as you heat them, it converts them into trans fatty. You may not start with trans fatty acids, but it will turn into trans fatty acids. Okay. And so that's kind of a lame, not quite true advertisement. So it's burnt oils. Essentially, it's heated oils, just okay. even heated oils. It doesn't have to be burnt, just heated. And then you're also superheating the carbohydrate in the potatoes. So you're getting acrylamides. Okay, a okay. double whammy. A double whammy. And if you go the other way, and you're using animal fats to fry things in, okay, which some of those fast food places do because it really tastes much better to fry potatoes in animal fats, you're getting heterocyclic amines because you're burning animal fats. You'll get uh, trans fatty acids, you'll get heterocyclic amines, and you'll get the acrylamides all from french fries that are fried with animal fats. And I know that's why you encourage people if you're going to use any oils type for your cooking that they use butter and do it on low heat so the butter doesn't turn brown. That's correct. You cannot fry with butter. I prefer that you cook everything by roasting, stewing, baking, uh, make soups out of things. Even when you have vegetables you're going to steam, I will then put a pat of butter on the steamed vegetables. It is not quite as hot as putting the butter in the pan and heating it that way. So when you steam a vegetable, uh, you're looking at steamed vegetables. You put a pat of butter on there and it melts them. That's a much safer way to right. use butter. I just don't like cooking with butter except soft scrambled eggs. Right. And when I soft scramble an egg, I like to um, put the, the skillet or the saucepan in a very, very low temperature that I can put my hand on that saucepan before I put the butter in there for okay. 10 to 30 seconds. It's going to be warm, but I can keep my hand there. It's not going to burn me. Okay. Then you can put the butter in there. It's not going to hurt it. Okay. So we have, we use more butter, we cook on lower temperatures. And use water, cook in water. Cook in water, okay. And at the same time, we want to probably decrease the amount. Is there anything wrong, even for those people that don't have CX, is there anything wrong with them decreasing the amount of gluten in their diet? See, here's the thing. If you're eating a lot of gluten, if you're eating a lot of uh, grains, wheat, barley, rye, and oats, cereals, pancakes, pasta, breads, uh, pop tarts, those kind of things. You're in danger, you're in jeopardy if you're restricting salt because you cannot make as much uh, stomach acid and as a result the pepsin doesn't work and then you uh, cannot digest the wheat proteins down into the simplest amino acids so there's large chunks of gluten come down there and cause problems. Let's talk about some of the symptoms of that because I know we see people with acid reflux or heartburn that tends to be caused from low stomach acid, not high stomach acid. That's right. And so when they say I have acid reflux, it's a misnomer. It's an incorrect, it's actually incorrect. And doctors perpetuate that because uh, they want to sell their Nexium and other um, what are called pro protein pump inhibitors, which okay. protein pumps is what's in, uh, what are in these chief cells that actually produce the stomach acid. And so things like uh, the purple pill Nexium. They poison those chief cells. Yeah, essentially that's what happens. They poison the chief cells so they can't make stomach acid. Okay, then initially you're gonna feel pretty good, but six months down the line, you're gonna wind up with all these deficiency diseases you never had before. Because even if you were supplementing with those nutrients, you cannot absorb them because you haven't acidified your stomach. And without an acid environment in your stomach, you get bacteria that lives down there and grows, and you eat and it eats, and it burps and kicks the it Produces acid. gas. When and it then, ferments the, the carbohydrates and sugars, it produces gas, which causes bloating, burping, belching, heartburn, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and that's what causes, like you said, the heartburn. It, that's it correct. Takes even weak stomach gas in the esophagus probably is, is pretty uncomfortable. Over time, yeah. And, of course, when you belch that up, 
uh, that weak stomach acid, it might be five or six, very close to neutral. It's like tasting vinegar. You just put raw vinegar on your mouth and it tastes like acid, but it's a pH of four to six. Right. It's not one. And so that's where people get the idea that it's acid reflux, and it's really not. It's not acid enough, and so things are able to grow in there and ferment carbohydrates. So if somebody has had acid reflux, you know, it's, again, a misnomer, but if they've had heartburn, if they've had those things, if they've been using carbonated beverages or mm -hmm. had salt-restricted diets, is or it Or even using these alkaline waters improperly, using them during meals, okay. drinking so, carbonated drinks during meals. So if they've been doing that, the chances are pretty high that they've had undigested gluten proteins in their intestines and they've developed an intolerance. That's right. And they cannot absorb minerals properly. They cannot absorb B12 because that castle's intrinsic factor only works in an acid environment. So there's many, many bad things that happen over time if you don't have a stomach pH of 1. Now, I know you look at people with essential fatty acid deficiencies with eczema mm -hmm. or asthma. And you've seen pictures of my own nephew mm -hmm. in Japan. And what happened with him uh, when he was young and they put the steroid creams to try to deal with the eczema, get him on the essential nutrients, more essential fatty acids, get the mother off the wheat, and things change. Um, but what are some of the other symptoms? I know that you talk about people with multiple diseases that are very different diseases, like a calcium deficiency is the same time as they have a copper deficiency is the same time they oh, have sure. other things. Um, that can be a sign of an absorption problem. Absolutely. And, of course, you see this in a hair analysis. When you look at a hair analysis, which can look at, they say, 30 to 50 different mineral levels in your hair, if they're all below normal, you know you have an absorption problem because that's not a natural thing. Some of them are going to be in the right in the middle of where you should be. Some are going to be a little high. Some are a little low. Some are in low normal. Some are in high normal. And so, you know, it should look like a stock market chart. But if everything, uh, but so. if everything's below normal, if you just kind of like a flat line, that means you're not absorbing. Okay. So you can actually use a hair analysis as a non-invasive, very economical test. Now, other things we see is we talk about if you've got a lot of bad bacteria in, the, in your colon, uh, you get a lot of smelly gas. You can have sulfurous gas because they produce sulfur dioxide. Um, and also, uh, the bad bacteria produce waste products. You know, they pee and poop, and it's called bacterial toxins. And this is where you get food poisoning. If you have, for instance, a Staphylococcus um, food poisoning, it produces a toxin that's very, very quickly, you'll be on your hands and knees throwing up and having diarrhea, you'll be a mess, headaches, and just really feel bad, and it can wind up killing you. Um, and you can get that within hours after you consume a Staphylococcus poison, okay, food poisoning. On the other hand, Salmonella food poisoning usually takes 12 to 24 hours after you consume salmonella bacteria for them to produce enough toxin to cause food poisoning. And so you can tell without even doing the culture whether it's a staph or a salmonella based on the timeline. You know, yeah, the timeline when you eat something and when the uh, food poisoning occurs. Well, what about copper deficiencies? Well, do you see people with celiac disease and absorption problems have a lot of gray hair? Is that common? Well, sure, they're going to have a lot more symptoms of copper deficiency, iron deficiency, uh, omega-3 essential fatty acid deficiencies, folic acid deficiencies, uh, which can be very bad in women who are in the age where they can, you know, childbearing age. Um, if you have a folic acid deficiency, even if you're eating lots of salads, you can have a baby born with spina bifida. Wow. If you have a zinc deficiency because you cannot absorb it, you're eating, you're supplementing with zinc, you can have a baby born with a cleft palate or heart defect. You can have a baby born with Down syndrome because you cannot absorb zinc. And so uh, these things are absolutely paramount to have optimal absorption of these nutrients. And so you have to pay attention to each digestive compartment, acid in your stomach, alkaline in your intestine, healthy bacteria uh, to fend off the bad guys in your colon. And it's uh, actually a lot of work to make sure all that functions properly and everybody's happy getting all the raw materials they need and keeping the bad stuff away. And this is where the trilogy of books, Let's Play Doctor, Let's Play Herbal Doctor, and the Passport to Aromatherapy come in. Uh, this is where the book Immortality comes in. This is where the book Dead Doctors Don't Like. I mean, they all talk about these things sometimes in segments. And there's another section in the book Rare Earths Been Cures, which talks about hair analyses and talks about how when all the minerals on a hair analysis are below the low normal line, that means you're not absorbing. And, you know, I see thousands of these a year. And now we're seeing tens of thousands, maybe millions a year. It's going up. It's going up because people are eating more grains and people are being told more and more by doctors to avoid salt. So that combination is very bad. So 
if somebody is using the 90 essential nutrients, we know if you give your body what it needs, it'll do some amazing things. That's correct. Okay, so you're doing some troubleshooting there. Using it, most people are going to get results when they absorb it, but if they're not getting results, the first thing we look at is, are they absorbing it? That is correct. So, in addition to going gluten-free, and it's important that they stay gluten-free so they keep their mm -hmm. absorption. That's correct. We often add the an enzyme product to help break it down, and especially people that say maybe they've had their gallbladder removed, and so they're not producing the, well, they're not storing enough enzymes to be able to. Well, they're not storing enough bile. Bile. Okay. okay. In that case, it's not enzymes. Actually, it's bile. It's kind of an emulsion. It's almost like detergent, is what it is. Bile is like a detergent, and it breaks down big globs of oil and fats down to little globs of oil and fats are more easily absorbed. So for those people, taking a, a great digestive enzyme and using probiotics, those can also help with people that are going gluten-free to help give them the right environment for the intestines to heal themselves? Well, by right environment, you're talking about digesting foods down properly, right? But you right. still have to have the proper pH in the stomach and the intestines. Okay. And uh, you have to have some of the pancreatic and intestinal enzymes that are coated so they don't get destroyed and digested in the, in the stomach, which is more acid, right? right. And so all these, all these factors have to come into play. And then, of course, our ultimate enzymes has ox bile in it to give you that um, ability to, I call it the gallbladder in a bottle, because it has the ability to, as you point out, give you the right amount of bile when you have a meal, particularly a fatty meal. Now, to know how bile works, what I want you to do is uh, take and put some like salad dressing oil or even corn oil or something like that in warm dish water and it just forms a coating over the entire uh, kind of right. like a blanket over the water surface of the water you get this oil that's just equally distributed take a couple of drops of a liquid dish detergent and put in there it just breaks up into little beads like BBs and just all breaks up and that's right. what bile does to the fats in your diet so how many enzymes and how often should a person take them? Well, I like them to optimally to take, say, two at the beginning of a meal with a couple ounces of water, our ultimate enzymes, which has the ox bile, the pepsin, the betaine hydrochloric to make stomach acid. It has the enzymes uh, from the pancreas, the pancreatic enzymes. It also has plant enzymes. It has bromelain from uh, pineapples, and it also has a papain from the papaya, which are very nice enzymes from plants. We don't need them on a daily basis, but if you have a digestion problem for a support, just like putting a cast on a broken leg, you're used as medicinally in that fashion. You don't need them all the time if you don't have a problem because you'll make your own enzymes. What about the four effects? How often and how many should the person use the four effects? I like to use the floor effects. I like to use the nightly essence. I like to use even the triple treat chocolate, which has probiotics in oh, it. That's great to use the probiotics, too. <laughs> yes. And you can use those as often as you want. They do not have to be consumed with meals. And actually, it's better if they're consumed in between meals because you have less stomach acid, so more are going to escape through the stomach without getting digested and killed. Now, I've seen uh, oftentimes people be encouraged to take, say, three floor right before they go to bed and three with breakfast. Right, and that's why we call nightly essence. Nightly essence, you're supposed to take it before bed. Right, okay, great. So... In addition to that, this is, uh, again, these aren't standalone products, but they go with the 90 essential nutrients, correct? That is correct. Now, I do have to make sure we say this. When you have celiac disease, and again, this is a progressive thing. It's going to get worse and worse and worse over time. When you get up to where you're 20, 30 years old and you have 50% of your intestines afflicted, you're going to have 20 diseases. You're going to have eczema. You're going to have asthma. You're going to have periodontal disease. You'll be infertile, low sperm count. You'll begin to get headaches, unexplained headaches, you get low blood sugar, low thyroid, you're getting bone spurs, you're mm -hmm. getting kidney stones, all this stuff is happening. You're going to 18 different specialists because you can't absorb those nutrients. There's nothing that says you can't have 50 different nutritional deficiencies at the same time. Now, what are some of those uh, historical cases? You know, you talk about a lot of famous people that a lot of the audience is probably familiar with that have had these absorption problems. You know, Karen Carpenter, uh, she, of course, she had um, an eating disorder called anorexia. Well, anorexia is a self-imposed restriction of consumption of food because you feel bad when you eat food. Hmm. And almost always is because they have celiac disease and they feel really, really bad when they eat wheat, barley, rye, and oats. And so they just give up eating and they keep going downhill. And they'll eat, they feel pretty good when they're fasting are eating lettuce and then they start eating breads and whole grains again because they know it's healthy, quote unquote, and then they get sick again, they stop eating. And so there's this downward spiral. They may level off for a while, for a couple of months, 
and then they start eating those whole grains again, they drop down lower and over a period of years, usually in their 20s and 30s, it will be really seriously ill with anorexia and some people can't give up eating and so they'll throw up the food as bulimia to, and they realize that if I throw it up, then I don't feel bad. But if I just eat it and leave it go down through my intestines, it feels like somebody's pulling a dry rag through my guts is how they describe it to me. Now, could obesity also be a result of poor absorption? Oh, absolutely. Because sugar is a very small molecule, and you can absorb sugars and get lots of calories in that fashion. But you cannot absorb minerals. You cannot absorb um, essential fatty acids. You cannot absorb cholesterol. And mineral deficiencies are what cause the insatiable cravings, the munchies. In animals, it's called cribbing or pica. And as soon as you're taking in enough minerals that you can absorb, all those cravings and munchies go away and you lose the weight. Yes. And the portion control becomes easy to accomplish. But you have to give up the gluten for your intestines to heal to then be able to absorb the minerals. Now, are there nutrients we can take to help the intestines heal? Well, glucogel is, is a, again, very good source of collagen, okay, which is the connective tissue. And so it's a source of of raw materials for the connective tissue part of the intestine to heal. You know, the things that the villi sit on is a connective tissue, essentially. It's like the foundation of a house or a slab that you build a building on. Okay. And that's, that's what the connective tissue is. And all these things are um, actually welded to that connective tissue. Okay. And the connective tissue, when it gets irritated, forms deeper and deeper and thicker and thicker scar tissue, which makes it even more difficult to absorb things through that scar tissue layer. Kind of like a callus. Yeah, it could be a callus, absolutely. But if you quit irritating it, how long does it take for those things to well, start? Optimally, if you're really, really good about staying away from everything, gravies and even making sure croutons don't find their way into your salad and you pick the croutons out, but there's still crouton dust right. in the salad, or you go to a health food store that sells bulk grains and there's always somebody there scooping grains into a plastic bag and then they throw that plastic bag on the um, belt that takes their, their food to the cashier, then you put your food on there or maybe you're a farmer and you're gluten-free in the household, but your husband or son or somebody's been outside in their clothes uh, mixing cattle feed that has wheat, barley, rye, or oats in it, and then they come in and they throw their clothing in the laundry with yours, you're gonna be constantly exposed, even though you think you're not. And so it's very, very important to, I mean, you gotta be really gluten-free to get maximum benefit. But uh, under optimal conditions, you're avoiding everything that has gluten in it. It's gonna take anywhere from 60 to 90 days to see recognizable benefit and it might take anywhere from six months to a year to get perfect 100 percent healing okay would taking a sec extra essential fatty acids would that help speed that process of rebuilding no but what it does do is make sure you're absorbing more of them it's just a matter of concentration the more you're throwing at it the more get through and so you can actually increase your risk of stroke because the essential fatty acids, one of the things it does is prevent abnormal blood clotting, which results in strokes, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, coronary thrombosis, thrombotic stroke. And so if you can't absorb omega-3s, it increases the risk, it of, stroke. Increases the risk of stroke. So this is why people die from celiac disease. And that's one of the things I know with the risk of stroke and heart disease that you actually fought with the FDA. So we can say that increasing your omega-3 essential fatty acids decreases the risk of heart disease. You got it. Well, is there anything else that people need to know? Um, the basics are be on the 90 essential nutrients. If you have digestive issues, you know, stay away from gluten. Yes. Adding some enzymes and flora can be good. Anything else? Yes, I would wean kids off of, and, and you hear the grandmothers will tell you, well, don't give your kids wheat until they're a year old, right? You right. hear that kind of stuff. Uh, that's because their little digestive tracts aren't prepared for those kinds of things. But if uh, if I had my way, nobody under 10 years old would eat grains. Okay, so uh, no. instead of pancakes or breakfast cereals, we'd have more Or eggs. toast, or pasta, okay. or crackers, and croutons, and hamburger buns, and hot dog buns, and muffins, and cake, and cookies, and all that kind of stuff. I would uh, have them only eat like an oriental. They're going to be eating sweet potatoes, and rice, okay. and millet, and flax. More vegetables. More vegetables. Uh, eggs for, for breakfast. Yeah. Nuts. Nuts for a snack. Great fats, healthy fats. Um, very little carbohydrates except for peanuts. I don't like peanuts because they have two bad things. One is a lot of carbohydrate. They also have a poison in them called aflatoxin, which causes liver cancer and liver cirrhosis and, and can cause sudden death. 
if you get a big enough concentration of aflatoxins, which is a byproduct of an infestation of a fungus in stored peanuts uh, called aspergillus, essentially bread mold. And I know you've actually had uh, some research on that bread mold, and wasn't that one of the wasn't that the cause of all of these bears across the world that were dying in zoos prematurely? Yes. Well, when Marlon Perkins uh, picked me to do that uh, study to do all these autopsies in the zoos, the first thing he told me was, "Look, we have a problem with bears, and one of the things I want you to do." is look at why all the bears around the world in zoos are dying of liver cancer and they only live to be about you know 30 to 35 they all die of liver cancer out in the wild they can live to be 60 years of age so what's going on there well i had just learned about aflatoxin because it was a very bad year for soybeans and there wasn't enough soybeans in america like in the summertime to make turkey feed so you could have turkeys for thanksgiving right and so um, uh, people who were making turkey feed for the turkey growers used uh, boatloads of a peanut meal from Nigeria to replace the, the inability to get uh, soybeans that year because there was a drought or something. Well, it turns out all those uh, uh, shipments of peanut meal from Nigeria were infestated with that um, aspergillus mold, that bread mold, and so it infested the turkey feed with aflatoxin, which is the poison produced by this aspergillus. And all the turkeys in America died of liver cancer. So they had to import turkeys from all over the world to have enough turkeys for Thanksgiving. Well, that had just happened when I got that position. So I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe the aspergillus is the same thing there. Maybe the aflatoxin is the same thing. And you can recognize uh, aflatoxin in food by getting in a completely pitch dark room, absolutely no light, and getting a black light, which is essentially an ultraviolet light, which they use in discotheques. They have all those right. luminescent lights, you know, and the really pretty yellows and oranges and purples and greens and blues. Well, these aflatoxins will fluoresce like that. So you can take a slice of bread that just looks like Wonder Bread. You get in there in the dark and you put that UV light on it. It'll fluoresce golden yellow and orange and green and blue. It's yeah. just very scary. Okay. And so I started doing that, and I would write letters to all these zoos, and because we didn't have faxes and emails in those days, we're talking about the 60s, right? And um, I'd, I'd say, well, what are you feeding your bears? And they're talking about a thousand-pound animal, a lot of expense to feed a bear. So they'd go to these thrift stores, you know, bread thrift stores, and get the week-old and two-week-old mold-infested bread, and they'd pay them a nickel a loaf for it just to get something for it. And they'd feed the bears that. Well, it's all infested with the aspergillus and the aflatoxins. That's, so we just switched them over to dog food, you know, like dry dog food in 50-pound bags, and the liver cancer in bears stopped overnight. And this was more than just one or two zoos. We're talking every, every zoo. Every zoo in the world. Because, every zoo in the world because every zoo in the world fed bears old moldy bread. And so what happened to the lifespan of the bears? Well, the now they're, they live up to 50 to 60 now instead of 35. Fantastic. And so that was a very quickie. That was one I got in there in the first couple of weeks. I figured that one out and said, well, this isn't all that hard. You know? <laughs> well, can health be that simple? For people? Health is that simple, Blake. It is that simple. Once you know the combination, it's like if you have a heavy-duty combination lock and you're there with a sledgehammer hitting that thing, you can't open it. Here comes a little three-year-old who knows the three numbers, right? Uh -huh. zero, zero, 007, 007. Yeah. And click, the thing opens up. And the same thing with the secrets of health and nutrition. Uh, congestive heart failure, the most common cause of death in Americans, is a simple thiamine deficiency, vitamin B1. It's the terminal event of beriberi thiamine deficiency. Now, what do doctors do? Well, they give you all kinds of pharmaceuticals and drugs uh, to regulate heartbeat and diuretics to get rid of the fluid that's collecting in your lungs and your chest and your belly cavity. And they give you digitalis uh, to make your heartbeat more effective. And then they put you on the heart transplant list. They give you a heart transplant. So you're looking at a half a million dollars. Well, all you have to do is put people on the 90 essential nutrients, get them off of sugar, which aggravates the thiamine deficiency, and you give them something like the de-stress uh, capsules, which um, two capsules gives you 3,000 times the minimum daily requirement of vitamin B1, not B-complex 100. We're talking about 3,000 times. And so when people have congestive heart failure, I like to give them six of those capsules a day, so they're getting 9,000 times the minimum daily requirement. And so... You get, and I can legally say, this will support and promote healthy cardiovascular metabolism. Give the body what it needs and it'll and, and it heal itself. Yeah. That's correct. And so this is as simple as it sounds. People say, it can't be that simple. I mean, otherwise my doctor would know about it. Well, 
not not, really. Because they're not trained in it. I know from my experience, you know, I was in pre-med and there was no nutrition in pre-med and they said in four years of medical school you can expect one 30-minute lecture on nutrition with no test. So expecting the doctors to understand nutrition, the, the, the MDs to understand nutrition, is like expecting your plumber to know how to fix your, all the computers. Part of your brain surgery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just really tragic. And, of course, medical doctors have such credibility and respect, and in many cases they deserve that. On the other hand, in many cases it's actually a fraud because the doctors don't know the basic stuff required by the human body, of, of which they're supposed to be in charge. Right. right. And one of the things I love about this mission and the message is that you don't have to be an expert to share it. You just have to learn how to share the tools because I know that I could share your CDs and it's more effective than me personally going out there and trying to tell somebody all there is about health. And it's easier for them to share it as well. And that's what we do to share this message with people and hopefully help America and the world. Exactly. Well, we can, we can actually save America and we can save the world, Blake. Uh, simply by teaching people how to take care of themselves because again there's no insurance policy that will prevent or cure disease when you pay for a health insurance policy all you're doing is betting that in the future you're going to screw up somehow and you're going to run up a big medical bill with doctors and hospitals you're going to need a lot of money to pay them doesn't do anything to prevent disease or cure disease that's your responsibility that's each of our own responsibilities people say to me well I don't have to worry about it I got good insurance well no, that's not quite true. It might pay the doctor when you get sick, but you're the one that's responsible to prevent yourself from getting sick. And especially, it's not just our health, it's the health of our families and our kids. And that's right, and grandkids and great-grandkids. I have to start speaking in those terms. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Wallach, for your time. Any last uh, words or messages? Well, just remember that if you're not salting your food, if you're not uh, digesting and absorbing your food properly, you could wind up by being damaged by a serial killer. <laughs> well, take it from Dr. Wallach. He's a horse doctor as well as a physician, and you know every farmer worth his salt puts out a salt block for his animals, and we need the same thing for us. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wallach.